If you were anything like me this weekend, you likely settled into your shack, turned on the radio, called out CQ, and then wondered if your radio was even connected to an antenna. The bands were dead, deader than dead, completely silent. Well, there's more to this silence than meets the eye, and it's not due to lack of activity on the bands either. We are currently at the pinnacle of Solar Cycle 25. Every solar cycle approximately 11 years witnesses the complete flip of the sun's magnetic field, swapping its north and south poles. Now this flip affects surface activity on the sun like sunspots, caused by magnetic fields. As these fields change, so does the sun's activity, including massive eruptions like solar flares and coronal mass ejections. These eruptions have huge effects here on Earth. Last weekend, many marvelled at photos of the aurora, a breathtaking display caused by solar eruptions. I even captured some stunning images myself of the southern lights with my iPhone. It's the first time I've ever seen them so bright, even to the naked eye. The aurora extended south, east, and west, even straight up into the air above us. And to be honest, I was pretty happy to forego some radio time for such an amazing display. But while these events are a treat for Aurora watchers, they wreak havoc on radio communications. The recent G5 storm caused massive disruptions, plunging the HF bands into darkness, with blackouts even extending up into the VHF range. It was as if antennas were just suddenly unplugged. Dr. Tamitha Scove, known as the Space Weather Woman, noticed that the storm was even so intense that it affected UHF and some gigahertz ranges. Now, GPS runs at just above one gigahertz and it gets hit the hardest. I noticed this firsthand as the signal to noise ratio on my GPS receivers plummeted at times, although I guess it shows the robustness of the system because it didn't drop out completely. Now you may wonder, isn't a strong solar cycle supposed to aid radio communication, especially on HF? Well, it does to an extent, but it all boils down to one thing, the right conditions at the right time. You see, we had too much of a good thing. Normally, when a solar flare happens on the sun, it releases a burst of energy and particles into space. When these particles reach Earth, they interact with the ionosphere. They can cause the ionosphere to become more ionized, meaning that there are more charged particles. This can temporarily change the way radio travels through the ionosphere. Sometimes it can make signals stronger, but other times it can weaken or just disrupt them altogether. During a geomagnetic storm, just like the one we experienced, radio waves may get absorbed instead of being reflected back to Earth, causing communication disruptions or blackout periods. So put into simple terms, solar flares can shake up the ionosphere, affecting how radio signals travel, which can impact communication on Earth. That is for both good and bad. Now, there are key solar indexes to determine geomagnetic activity, the A index and the K index. The K index values between 0 and 1 suggest good HF band conditions, whilst values between 2 and 4 indicate unsettled or active conditions, likely degrading HF conditions. Moving up the scale, 5 represents a minor storm, while 6 to 9 represents a major storm, resulting in HF communication blackouts we just experienced over the weekend. But I mean, it could be much, much worse. The Carrington event occurred during the solar cycle 10 in September 1859, and it was the most intense geomagnetic storm recorded in history. It caused widespread auroral displays and sparked fires in tele telegraph stations globally. This storm, likely triggered by a coronal mass ejection from the sun, collided with Earth's magnosphere, inducing strong electric currents in these telegraph systems, leading to failures and electric shocks for some operators. Now, some operators even managed to continue communication using only the induced currents from the auroras. Now, research believes that if a similar event occurred today, it would cause widespread electrical disruptions, blackouts, and even damage to the electrical power grid. Now, luckily, we haven't seen anything like this to date, but how do you know when things are actually looking good, especially for amateur radio? Well, to predict band conditions, I rely on solarham.com for real-time updates. Now, pay attention to the Solar Flux Index, the SFI, and Sunspot Number, the SSN. They should ideally be high in the yellow or red. 
Also keep an eye on the geomagnetic field and aurora chart. Lower values, preferably in the green, indicate better HF conditions. So in short, for optimal conditions, the solar flux should remain above 150 for a few days, with the K index below 2. But it's not all bad news. Over the weekend, lots of amateur radio operators made contacts on the 6 metre and 2 metre amateur radio bands via auroral backscatter propagation. This involves everyone pointing their antennas towards the poles, whether that be north or south, depending on your location in the world, and reflecting your signal back to another station also pointing in that same direction. You can use digital modes that tolerate the wide spreading of signals, such as Q65, CW or even SSB, although you'll notice some severe distortion on the signal as my mate Steve VK3KTT shows right here. Things certainly aren't finished for the sun just yet. Solar Cycle 25 is gearing towards its peak, if not already there, promising plenty of excitement on the ham radio bands. But remember, it won't last forever. To make the most out of the current conditions, you can watch my video right here.